Great. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, there's some seats here up front if anybody would like to uh, not stand for the duration of the event. Um, I just quickly wanted to um, welcome everybody and let you know how excited I am to be here with um, Manny, who has been a guest lecturer in my course twice, but we've never actually met in person um, because that course was uh, remote <laughs> both times. So it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to just start by asking Manny to open it up with a conversation about his book and um, maybe read a little bit and then I'll have a few questions and we'll, we'll go to the audience. So go ahead, Great. Manny. Thanks so much. Uh, and thank you uh, for joining us this evening. I, uh, I have been in this room before, but only very, very briefly. Uh, my, my daughter, who I'm so, just delight, so delighted is with us tonight as <laughs> uh, uh, an alumna of the University of Chicago. And I think this was her favorite place in Hyde Park spent a lot of hours in this, uh, in this room and in this place. Uh, so I, I feel uh, very connected, at least uh, vicariously. Um, it's a real honor, and when you look at the, at the list of authors who are part of this series, it's, it's a real who's who. So it's, it's, it's delightful to be here. Um, this book is, you know, I've done, a, this book came out in, in, in August, and I've, I've done a, a number of events around this book, mostly in the water sector. Uh, and the, you know, the book, uh, the, it's very subtle cover art uh, sort of <laughs> just gets after one of the main themes, which is, of course, the rise of the bottled water industry and what it says about trust in tap water. And it is definitely a book about drinking water. But it is also a book about, about something else. It's a book, in some ways, about something deeper. Uh, you know, the, we, we like, we, my, my co authors and I, you know, Sam and, and David, we think that drinking water has something to say about democracy has something to say about governance and legit the legitimacy of governments uh, and how governments gain trust and how governments lose trust. So I'm going to sort of take this opportunity, since most of the audiences I talk to are, are water audiences, I'm going to take a little, little time to, to kind of think about those deeper themes uh, in, in my remarks tonight. Um, I also I'm, I have to say just before I launch into that stuff, I'm delighted that no one's holding a bottle of water right now from <laughs> you know, a bottle of Evian or, or Aquafina. I, I gave a talk in Madison uh, a few months ago uh, to, to some undergraduates, and when the topic of the book came out, I saw a lot of very a lot of scurrying to put the, the bottle <laughs> under the jacket or under <laughs> under a bag. People, I'm not here to shame anybody, uh, simply to shed light uh, <laughs> on the issue. So this, this book, I, you know, this book started out as a, as a collaboration with Samantha Zulke, who is now a, a professor at the University of Iowa. But at, at the time we started this project, she was a graduate student at Texas A&M, where, where I was on the faculty. And you know, we didn't start, set out to write a book about democracy and drinking water. Uh, one of the, what we set out to do was to, to understand something that we thought was weird. It was kind of a classic sort of social science story. Um, one of the things that happens when you move to a new place, you notice things that people who, are, uh, who, who live there, who have lived there a long time, don't notice. We all, we all become familiar with the things around us to the point where they are no longer novel. Right? Nothing is novel if you walk by it every day. You know, I think about you know, Roby House here. Right? What a spectacular thing. But if you live in Hyde Park, if you go to the University of Chicago, it's just a, it's just a building in your neighborhood. Right? It's, it's not a, an architectural marvel that those of us who have never seen it appreciate. Well, when I moved to Texas, um, 2013, I joined the faculty there, and a year later, Sam came, uh, came to join as a, as, a, as a PhD student, we noticed these things, these, these drinking water kiosks. Now in Texas, uh, and on much of the, the sort of sun belt of the United States, there are these water, drinking water vending machines, and they're out on street corners, often in parking lots of strip malls, and I had never seen these things before. I didn't know what they were. They, I, thought, I thought that was weird. Why, you know, what, it, it's, a, it's a vending machine that sells water? Like, what, what is that? Uh, and I, as, as I was noticing these things, I, I also saw a poster for a lecture on campus about uh, drinking water kiosks. I said, oh, somebody's going to give So I went to this talk. It was by a geographer named Wendy Jepson, who gave a, she's an anthropologist and a geographer, and, and she had done a study of these drinking water kiosks in South Texas in the Rio Grande Valley. And her argument was that these kiosks are there because the communities there in the, in the Rio Grande Valley have very, very poor tap water service. Some don't have tap water at all. So people come to rely 
on these kiosks, uh, and, and it was a failure of governance because the local governments were not responding to the needs of, of those people. And I thought, okay, that, that makes sense to me. But that's the South Rio Grande Valley. Why do I see kiosks in Houston? Why do I see kiosks in Austin? Why do I see them in Denver and Atlanta and, and Los Angeles? You know, Houston, Houston uh, has dozens of these water kiosks across the city, and Houston uh, has never had a Safe Drinking Water Act violation in its entire history. By the way, we published this book, and then shortly thereafter, Houston had its first boil water <laughs> notice ever. <laughs> Thanks, Houston. Uh, so anyway, we, I saw, the, saw these, these kiosks, and I said, Sam, I want to know what's going on with these kiosks. Now, Sam has a background in geography, and she's a spatial econometrician. So we started in this, this effort of, of locating all of the kiosks in the United States that are operated by the two biggest com companies. They're called Watermill Express and Ice House America. And we thought we were writing a little paper. And I thought, because I had this hypothesis that maybe what we're picking up here is that it's a luxury good of some kind in urban areas, right? Because it's 35 to 50 cents a gallon to buy water out of one of these machines. Tap water costs about a penny a gallon. So I'm thinking it's got to be some kind of luxury good. That's why people are doing it. So we do this analysis, and it turns out uh, not, uh, it's not a luxury good. They're, they're cluster these things are spatially clustered in poor neighborhoods. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that Sam did was very clever. She led a group of, of, of undergraduates who used Google Street View to sort of get a sense of the neighborhoods where these things were located. And overwhelmingly, they're located in the parking lots of dollar stores. So clearly, this is not a luxury product, right? These things aren't parked out in front of the Starbucks. They're parked in front of the Dollar General. So, so OK, we can check. We can eliminate that hypothesis. So maybe I thought, maybe, maybe there's, this has something to do with pockets of access. Maybe there are places in urban areas where there's no access to tap water, and that's why people are, are using these things. Well, we, we could very, very quickly check that off the list, too, because you know, we're looking at, at the uh, at number of these cities you can get on GIS systems and find out where all the water mains are. And no, these, th there's, these, these, there's plenty of water mains in these neighborhoods where these things are located. So there's something else going on there. And the more we dug into it, the more we began to realize that there was a, a pattern everywhere these kiosks appeared. That is that they were in low socioeconomic status neighborhoods, neighborhoods that had very low income, low levels of education, low levels of political participation, and overwhelmingly black and especially Hispanic, and in some parts of the country, Asian populations. So this was very quickly, clearly, uh, becoming something of a social phenomenon. And we were trying to understand it, because these were cities that have world-class drinking water utilities, uh, excellent regulatory compliance records, clean, non-corrupt governments by and large, and yet these kiosks are thriving. So we're scratching our heads over this and trying to figure out what's happening here. And about that time, we went to a conference and heard a talk by another one of my former students who ended up becoming our, our third author on this project, David Switzer. He gave a talk. Uh, about bottled water consumption and trust in government. And he, his main finding was that people who distrusted government drank bottled water. And Sam and I looked at each other and said, I think David's on to something here. Maybe that says something about the kiosk. And three, four years later, we have this book. So it's, it's really a, it's a process of noticing that which is in plain sight, but, but we don't think about it because it, it's so ubiquitous. In some ways, the bottled water, bottled water has become ubiquitous. One of the, one of the events I, get, I, uh, I spoke at about this book, I, I, it was, I was at a, in a stage set up very much like this, but instead of having a mug full of tap water, they gave us bottles of <laughs> water. And that has simply become an expectation in a lot of settings now. You go to a business meeting, there's, there's bottles of water on the table. And we think about the subtle signals that, that that sends to people. You know, water is the most basic of basic human needs. It is the most basic of basic services. And what, what Sam and David and I did with this was we, once we realized we were picking up on common patterns, it caused us to step back and think about first principles of government. You know, a central tenet of liberal democracy, like central theory behind liberal democracy, arguably the central tenet behind liberal democracy, is that governments gain their legitimacy by providing for their people's basic needs. And they lose their legitimacy when they, lose, when, when they fail to provide for those basic needs. That is not a revolutionary thought. Well, OK, it was revolutionary 400 years ago, <laughs> but it's not revolutionary now. It's right there in the Declaration of Independence. It's not a, not a novel claim. 
But we thought that this, the fact that people are turning to kiosks, that people are drinking bottled water, must say something about our basic needs. If you think about the way that governments establish their legitimacy, civilizations everywhere at all times have used water to establish their legitimacy. Think about the, about the civic architecture of ancient Rome or ancient Egypt for that matter. The, the, the water infrastructure is very visible and it's there to send a signal to the public about the, the genius and the might of the state. You know, one of America's most famous pieces of water infrastructure is here in Chicago. Very ornate, very public. It's a water tower. They wanted you to see it, right? <laughs> it was not trying to hide. It was trying to tell everybody, hey, look at this thing, celebrate it. Uh, we've gotten away from that, and now water has become this thing uh, that, that we distrust. And so we think that has something to tell us about the legitimacy of the state. So I'm going I'm to give the, the central argument in very, very brief uh, terms here that sort of carries through the thread of the book. I don't want to, I don't want to belabor it. Um, but basically, it, it starts with that. Governments build their legitimacy on basic services, uh, and when those basic services fail, when government fails to provide those basic services, it under, that failure undermines the legitimacy of government. And with water, it's different from other things. Water, as I said, the most basic of basic services, it's literally essential, like it's our essence is, is, is primarily water, our bodies are mostly water. It is, a, it is a service very different from almost anything else government does. Water is the most intimate relationship between people and the government. It's a government service that comes directly into your house, into your bathroom. So it's the government coming into your bathroom, and it's coming there 24 hours a day. Uh, we drink it, right? We, 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 we cook with it, we immerse our children in it, we, we take it into our bodies. There are not many things that the government does that we ingest. It is the most intimate relationship. And so when that fails, it's a different kind of failure from anything else. It's a very personal kind of failure, and we think that that, that, that undermines uh, trust in, in a very profound way. And so we, what we think happens, and we, we, this is a thread that carries throughout the book, is a vicious cycle sets in. Government establishes its legitimacy by providing for basic service, and when there's a basic service failure, that failure damages trust. When someone has experienced a failure, there's a classic theory in economics from a guy named Hirschman, it's called Exit Voice and Loyalty, and he says, I see nodding heads, great, well-educated crowd. Uh, <laughs> People face this exit or voice decision. If I'm unhappy with the service, I can choose to use my voice and ask the firm, or, or in this case, a government that has failed, to improve things, or I can exit for an alternative. Businesses are very well tuned to exit. Businesses are always worried about who the customers they're gaining, the customers they're losing, because the best thing to do, easiest thing to do, a great example here is, is, is exit. Great example here on, uh, at the University of Chicago, and I, I, I looked at my Google map, and I looked coffee. You, you can't spit without hitting a coffee shop in, the, in this, this several blocks area. So if you are ever unhappy with a coffee shop, there is no reason for you to go to the management and complain because you can walk three minutes and find another coffee shop that's probably better. So exit is always a good option. But when you're talking about something like a water utility, exit is very costly, right? So you're, you're, you're talking about have to, having to move. Um, and governments are not really very well attuned to exit. What they're attuned to is voice. Governments are used to responding to voters, lobbyists, people who show up and complain about things and show up to, to, to demonstrations and so on. So, go, so people face this exit or voice choice. And what happens when there's a, a, a pub basic service failure is that the people who use voice are using their voice because they have a rational expectation that the government is going to respond by helping, by improving the situation. Well, you only do that if you believe that the government is competent and moral. If you believe that the government is incompetent or immoral, it makes no sense to use your voice because that's just shouting into the wind. Instead, you will choose to exit. And we think that that's what's happening. People are choosing bottled water. They're choosing kiosks. Kiosks cost 35 to 50 times the price of tap water. A bottle of water that you buy in a case of, at Walmart costs 200 times uh, what tap water costs on average across the United States. So people are paying 200 times as much because they would rather exit to a commercial provider than use their voice. Next step, having chosen exit instead of voice, 
people who are dissatisfied with government no longer participate in politics. There's no, they're not participating, uh, they're, they're voting at lower levels, they're not participating in, in civic life more generally, uh, and then that reduces then the signal that governments get from the electorate. People stop using voice, governments have no incentive to respond, and that causes services to decline even further and a vicious cycle sets in. We devote the better part of 200 pages to uh, demonstrating each step of this cycle. Uh, we, have, we throw a lot of different data at this problem, but, but that's the central argument. That's the bad news. But ultimately, it's a good news story because we think that this vicious cycle can also be virtuous. You flip all of those, those hypotheses around and the same thing can also be true. You, you, when government performs well, it builds trust, causes people, instead of exiting, they choose to voice. That creates greater incentives, and provides greater resources to government to perform better, and it's a positive feedback cycle. So we think both things can happen, uh, and, and, and ultimately we, we think this is, a, this is a happy story, at least a potentially happy story. A step back to the big picture, though, for a minute. This is a story about democracy as much as it is about drinking water because this is, this, is, this is a book where our empirical case is drinking water, but we think this really has to do with basic services. You know, we are at a moment in world history, really, not just American history, but world history where democratic governments are, many parts of the world are suffering crises of legitimacy. And a lot of political scientists have different takes on why that might be. I think our take here is that it has something to do with basic services. It has something to do with people's perceptions that the government is making their lives better. Whether that's direct production of something like drinking water or it's an effective regulatory regime, people no longer, or a large swaths of the population, no longer believe that government is working for them. And that is not particular to the ideological left or the ideological right. You can find lots of people who distrust institutions at every part of the, uh, the, the ideological spectrum. You know, we, when we were writing the very last chapter of this book, uh, I remember sitting at my computer, uh, I had two monitors open. And on one monitor, I've got Microsoft Word and the, and the manuscript for the conclusion of this book. On the other monitor, I've got Twitter, and I'm doom scrolling. Uh, out of the corner of my eye on January 6, 2021. And I, I'm reminded of the meme with the dog in the burning room, like, this is fine. I'm just working on my manuscript here as the Capitol is on fire and rioters and, and, and so on. But it really brought home to me how, you know, what's at stake here? You know, the very legitimacy of, of these state institutions, and, and we've, we've got large swaths of the population who no longer believe that government is either competent or moral. Well, how do you establish competence and morality? Well, we, we want to say it's basic services. It's about getting the basics right. Uh, and, and, and showing that we make life better, that the state can make life better through effective regulation, in some cases through production. I'm going to close with the, the closing passage from the book which I think tries to make this point. Uh, providing tap water is not the nation's most dire or intractable challenge. In indeed, its very tractability is part of what makes drinking water so important for government's legitimacy. Other grand challenges, such as fighting climate change, curing cancer, protecting against nuclear terrorism or preventing uh, the proliferation, excuse me, pre pre preventing the, uh, uh, the proliferation of nuclear weapons are complex and fraught with uncertainty. Drinking water problems are easy by comparison. The fundamental scientific knowledge needed to provide tap water already exists by and large. The main barriers to progress in the U.S. water sector are social. They're economic and organizational. Overcoming those barriers is principally a political challenge. With excellence, openness, and equity at the tap, governments can earn the legitimacy necessary to tackle the world's most dire problems. Rebuilding democratic governance thus begins with literal rebuilding. The nation's tap water problems are soluble, and solving them will demonstrate to citizens that democracy can fulfill the promise of a better life. Sound public services run by competent, compassionate, and responsible people can establish performative and moral trust between citizen and state the ubiquitous, life-sustaining infrastructure buried beneath our streets holds not only water, but also the chance for visionary leaders to restore faith in America. Healthy water, healthier water systems make a healthier republic. 
And that was a passage I was writing on January 6th, 2021. Very much the, the theme that we hope uh, folks take away from this, beyond all of the stuff about bottled water and, and uh, uh, patterns of, of consumer behavior. That's the message that, that we want to get across. Great, fantastic. I just learned a lot about democracy. <laughs> so uh, let me just start with one question about water, then one question about government, and then I, I'll open it up because um, I'm sure there's a lot of questions. So, I, uh, so one time on this campus, there was a movement to get rid of all the bottled water vending machines. And um, this wasn't in the list of questions I gave you, but I just thought of it. But um, as well as to stop selling bottled water in the cafes on campus. And so I was walking to class to teach my econ class. And on the, all of the vending machines, there was a flyer that said, tap water is free. So I took it off, walked to my econ. That was my class for the day, right? It's <laughs> tap water free. So I guess the question that I have about this is, there's this expectation, right, that the government provides basic services. So people turn on their tap. They expect water to come out. They might not really think about it very much, right? Mm. They expect the water to come out. It's essentially free. I mean, it's very cheap, right? right. Um, it's essentially free, or people think of it that way. So walk me through when they turn it on and the water doesn't come out, or the water's brown, or it smells bad, right? Like, what's the path to this, this loss of trust in government? Is it accumulation of events that this leads to this? Is it that, um, you know, maybe it's a combination of, of water, but then it's also the government is doing other things like telling us what to do, which we don't like either. And so how, how does this accumulate into this level mm. of distrust that um, leads to some kind of exit, as you've said? Yeah, boy, there's a lot going on in that yeah, question. Yeah, uh, let me answer that in, in a couple of ways. One, as I said, wa water is different, especially tap water. It's different from a lot of other things because it's so intimate, mm -hmm. because it, it's so important. To Most of us wake up, that's our first interaction with government every morning. We wake up, we turn on a tap. And there's this government regulated, government provided, <laughs> in many cases, government, government supplied product uh, right, in, right in our bathrooms. Um, and so I think, I think when there's that, that failure there, when we sense a failure, uh, when, the, when the water either doesn't come out or the pressure is very low or there's a boil water notice in our neighborhood or even just, if it just looks funny, smells funny, tastes funny. Uh, I think there's something very visceral that, that people, people respond and I think the data support that. Even some stuff that, that, that we've come up with since the book was published. But I think that the deeper question about the distrust in the state gets at something else we, we get at in the book, which is, you know, people don't come to their tap water as blank slates, right? We, they come with attitudes about government and its basic competence and its basic mm -hmm. benevolence. And so two different people can experience the same tap water failure and come to different kinds of conclusions. Now, you can have some folks who, you know, let's say your town has a boil water notice. You have a main break, there's a boil water notice. Some folks will drink, everybody will drink bottled water that day. By the end of the week, some people will have returned to drinking tap water and some people will never return to tap water and they will stay drinking bottled water the rest of their lives. We think that has something to do with people's, what we, you know, what social scientists would call priors. It has something mm -hmm. to do with the way people, the expectations people bring into their interaction with government. So if I expect government to be basically competent, basically benevolent, if there's a mistake, I think, well, it was a mistake. They're basically competent, they're basically moral they'll do better next time. If I expect that government is basically evil or basically stupid or incompetent, then that failure simply affirms my prior expectation and it, it, it strengthens the, uh, the, the impulse to exit. Um, so I, I think what folks, folks uh, again, this is not particularly ideological, but folks bring expectations about government's uh, benevolence and government's, or government's malevolence uh, and, and that informs their perceptions. Uh, we, one of the things that we, we trace out in one of the chapters of the book is how um, the first people to exit for tap, from tap water to commercial water are uh, members of ethnic and racial minority communities and, and the poor. And these are folks who generally suffer from failures of political institutions. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if I am non-white, if I am poor, I look at the Flint water crisis, it might be 500 miles away, but I can identify with those people. And I think, man, the, the, the institutions failed them. They're probably gonna fail me too. Uh, 
and, and one of the, the, the really key important findings, and I have to give Samantha Zolke all the credit for this, is that the vectors of distrust, you know, distrust failure anywhere causes dis, distrust everywhere. But the vector of distrust is not geographic space, it's social identity. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's people, it's poor people across the country look at Jackson, Mississippi and say, ah, see, there you go. They hate us. They, they aren't going to help us. Uh, the government will fail us. Uh, and so I might as well put my faith in uh, the commercial firm. Now we show all the ways in which that is maybe not the best choice because commercial drinking water, or commercial bottled water is not necessarily of any better quality. In some cases might be worse quality, but that's not an irrational choice. It's not an irrational choice by someone to abandon it because of those priors, uh, because that history, those, those legacies of institutional biases uh, come into that interaction with the water. Great. So um, another question I had is, so you very um, elegantly went, turned the vicious cycle into a virtuous, virtuous one. Mm -hmm. uh, and if maybe I could take it back to the, the vicious one for, for a minute here uh, with a cynical or perhaps somewhat sinister take on this is that it seems like what, what's set up here is there's, that there's a motive for private interests, the private bottled water industry or others to support attempts to create distrust in government. Yeah. Right, um, and so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, again, the very, very subtle cover image sort <laughs> yeah. of tells that tells that story. Yeah, I can't imagine why people think this book is just about water. Uh, yeah. No, no, the, that, that's absolutely right. You know, one of, one of my favorite examples I love to do when I'm when I'm giving a talk with a big PowerPoint slide deck and all that. I have this picture. Uh, yeah, yeah, the. the uh, talk about the picture in a second. Yes, the the commercial uh, water industry, the bottled water, the kiosk. Definitely stoking distrust in, in tap water. And they're not always very subtle about it. Uh, they also do a lot of race baiting and they're not subtle about that either. So uh, let, me, let me give you an example. When we lived in, in Houston before moving north here, I was, uh, I, and this time Houston had had a perfect record on, on drinking water. They just come through Hurricane Harvey without a, without a hitch. Uh, and I was at the supermarket uh, shopping and I noticed this kiosk from the Primo company and I took a picture of it and the picture is not subtle. The picture is a picture of a rusty pipe and it says your tap water hang, can, hangs out in CD joints. <laughs> and buy this product, you know, it's 50 cents a gallon or whatever it was. And I'm thinking this is in Houston, Texas in a neighborhood that has never had a tap water, but we don't have, we don't have main breaks. We, it, everything's great in this neighborhood and, and they're selling this fear of tap water. And one of the things we found in researching this book, we, we, got, we started drilling down into Primo's advertising and marketing. So they make, uh, the Primo is a publicly traded company, has to make certain um, disclosures to the Securities and Exchange Commission. They, in their 10K uh, filing to the SEC, statement to their investors, and they identify their growth plans. Right there in their growth plan, in the, in the Securities and Exchange Commission, they say, Growing distrust in municipal tap water is their growth model. Right? They say it's also healthy lifestyle. They say <laughs> healthy lifestyle and then distrust in municipal tap water is what's going to cause people to, uh, to buy our, more of our product. Uh, and the irony then is later on in the same statement, they had the, the SEC requires them to declare the major threats to their business model going forward. And one of the threats to their business model was deteriorating municipal water quality. You might ask why. It's because their source water is municipal tap water. Uh, there was just a paper study, uh, published very recently in a scientific journal uh, that did, did water quality testing on a whole suite of bottled water products. And they found that a lot of them didn't meet uh, Safe Drinking Water Act standards. Uh, and the ones that did, and the ones that had the highest water quality, their source was municipal tap water. Uh, and, and anything that was labeled spring water was much more likely <laughs> to, to have contaminants. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's very much stoking this distrust. We wanted to put a picture, that picture in the book and our lawyers wouldn't let us. Uh, we also wanted to put some of the, we had two other pictures. We had some advertising that's very clearly marketed at black folks. Some advertising is very clearly marketed at, at Hispanic folks. Uh, these, these water kiosk companies very cynically uh, provide scholarship programs for Hispanic kids in Texas, and I was like, yeah, it's just it's very it's very painful for me to see. Um, again, none of the lawyers wouldn't let us put any of those images in the book, <laughs> but we we had a lot of images of uh, 
uh, of advertising is very much targeted at minority communities, suggesting that the tap water is unsafe and suggesting that the bottled water product is, is, uh, is superior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're definitely doing it. Mm -hmm. So um, you, in your book, you talk about, um, you distinguish between the role of different levels of government. Right, and um, I'm curious if you can talk about how the trust at these different levels of government. So are people more likely to trust their local government than the federal government or say a state government? I mean, obviously in, in Illinois, for example, people in Chicago feel very differently than people in downstate Illinois about their state government, mm -hmm. right? In Wisconsin, the same thing. So I'm just, I'm wondering if people have more trust or faith in their local government because they feel like they know them better or it's an interesting question. Yeah, very broadly, on average, Americans do tend to trust their local governments more than the state, and they tend to trust the state more than the federal. But that's on average. Mm -hmm. right? uh, there are definitely you know, f factions within the population where it breaks differently. You know, a lot of that can have to do with partisanship. Uh, a lot of that can have to do with other kinds of social identities and who's controlling the state house, who's controlling the White House. Right. You know, people's, people's uh, uh, trust in the federal government changes a lot depending on which party is in power. Uh, so that, that, that can swing around a lot. Um, uh, the thing that we found empirically with, with respect to, to drinking water is drinking water quality or perceived drinking water quality affected trust at all levels. And in the United States, we don't do anything where all three levels are, of government aren't involved. They, they're, they're, everybody's involved in everything. Drinking water is no different. All three levels of government are involved. And tap water failure undermines trust at all three levels. Mm -hmm. But as you might expect, the biggest impact is local. Yeah. Because in most cases, that's who's providing uh, providing the water. 85% mm -hmm. of Americans get their water from a local government. Great. So I um, have, uh, as you can see, a lot of questions, but I wanted to give the audience an opportunity to ask any questions. Um, uh, Ed, in the back, do we have a, oh, we have a microphone, so if you can wait. I think the microphone's for the recording, right? So you might just have to speak up anyway. <laughs> I don't know if this works. That's okay. The, the microphone is just for the recording, so you won't actually hear yourself amplified. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> thank, you. The, uh, no, thank you for joining us this evening. Great research. And I think that what you've put together is really important in influencing public policy, uh, hopefully uh, to make things better for, for future generations. You know, why doesn't the government just charge excise taxes on bottled water, even more so to kind of slow this down because what's good for the people, the tap water is just as good. If they charge more in excise, excise taxes, there should be a breaking point where it will transition back. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, my co-author David Switzer wrote a, a nice little essay that sort of addresses this question. Um, given all of the, the negative, the, the, the dubious benefits and the huge negative externalities associated with bottled water, this is a common argument. Why, should, why don't we just tax it. You know, I, we even talk about the, the bottled water's carbon footprint, which is absurd, the microplastics and the, and the disposal, the trash and all that. Um, the main argument against taxing it, and, and I, I am against taxing bottled water in particular. I, I, don't, I mean like an extra excise tax on, on bottled water. And it's because of the distributional effects. It's because bottled water is predominantly consumed by the poor. And unless and until we do the hard work of restoring that trust and establishing that trust, uh, taxing bottled water exorbitantly will only um, be more regressive. It's, it's going to take a, a bad problem and make it worse. Now, what I would think about, I actually blogged about this some years ago, I would, I would think about maybe levying a very large tax in which you could think of sort of the luxury bottled water. You know, uh, I'm talking about the difference between the cases of Arrowhead at Walmart versus the $7, you know, half liter of Fiji water. You know, when, in, in 5,000 years when archaeologists are sifting through the ruins of our society, they're going to find this thing called Fiji water, and they're going to go, ah, uh, this is why they collapsed, <laughs> right? They, they, they were bottling water from, uh, they're mining water from a non-renewable uh, source in the South Pacific and putting it on a ship and sailing it to Chicago and selling it for seven bucks. Right? Yeah, what, and then so the climate collapsed. Right? 
that's what happens. So that, that's why I think that's the argument against taxing it. Um, so maybe maybe like a tax on the luxury brand. But we go, we got to get control. Of, people have to believe that uh, that the product is good. Um, and, and I think of this con uh, this all the time. I don't know if you all know that there's this pro there's a canned water product now. It's very popular called Liquid Death. <laughs> people are buying a product called Liquid Death. And drinking that instead of tap water. I mean, yeah, I don't know how much more damning you can get about trust. Um, like with death. Who buys that? <laughs> <laughs> Elena? Yeah, thanks so much. I, I love this research, and I'm really excited to, to hear what else is uh, on the horizon for you. But on the, on the solutions front, so it seems like there's a couple of different promising pathways. One is the government continues to publish these disclosures, right? About, we all get these mailings of what's in our water. I don't know if you've seen these, but oh, like, yeah. right. So, so is there research about what's the most effective? Because I can tell you the ones that I get have a uh, very difficult to decipher. It's like, is this good? It's a lot of numbers, I like, you know, right? So, so, so there's that, which is within government's control, yeah. but maybe if you don't trust government, you don't care what they're communicating to you, right? But so that's, that's vector one I'm interested in. Vector two is actually the rise of home testing, where you mm. buy it yourself, you do it yourself, you validate yourself. And do you think there's some promise there if you don't trust government? Can you get a very low cost test distributed where you can actually find out yourself and make the call? Do you want to go buy it or do you want to trust what's coming out of the tap? So I'm interested in what do we need to know about both of those angles? Better communication, direct from government to build trust and better just you know, direct consumer verification? Yeah, both, both great questions. So let, let me talk about the first one. For, I'll take them in order. Um, so the, the thing Elena is referring to is something called a consumer confidence report. Uh, back in 1996, I think, uh, Congress passed a series of amendments to the Safe Drinking Water Act that require these things called uh, con uh, consumer confidence reports. Uh, every water system in the country is supposed to publish this report annually and send it to all its customers. Uh, that it informs them of the, their drinking water quality. Uh, the name Consumer Confidence Report ends up being quite ironic because in the one empirical study on the effects of consumer confidence reports, the researchers found that they actually reduced confidence in water <laughs> mm -hmm. because they are so badly designed. Yeah. They communicate so poorly. I, I literally have a PhD and I get these things and I can't understand them. It, it takes me forever to decipher most of them. They're very, very poorly designed. And utilities treat them as a box checking exercise. I complied with the rule. I did exactly the minimum that the state regulator requires me to do. I mailed it to everybody. I'm done. And as I said, the one study we have on this shows that they actually make people afraid. It has, the, has exactly the opposite from the intended effect. So what do we do about that? Well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to say I'm actually working on a, on a proposal right now at the NSF where, where my, uh, my co-authors my co and I are doing the next phase of this research. And one of the pieces that Professor Switzer is leading is, a, a, is an experimental study on CCR design. Hmm. So they're going to use, uh, try to try out a number of different designs. We're playing out with the idea of doing video as a way to present the information. Mm -hmm. uh, you could even use sort of like an AI generated video that would, would change based on the, the, um, the testing qualities that came out. And we want to find ways that are more effective. Uh, right now, we don't know how. Um, there are uh, a, a number of, of consulting firms out there who claim that they know how they're making it up. They, they, they just don't know. Um, but we're, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna try to figure that out. On the home testing regimes, this is a really interesting idea. Um, I don't know of any empirical research on that question. But yeah, you can imagine this going well or going badly. Uh, one of the things we know about water quality testing is that if you don't do it exactly right, anybody who's in here who spends a lot of time doing chemistry, you <laughs> accidentally brush the tip of your, you know, your, your test tube against the wrong thing. You sneeze while you're taking the sample, <laughs> you know, th then the thing is shot. Right? Uh, I, I heard about a, uh, this is an anecdote, but I, I heard from a state regulator one time who said that they, had, they thought they had a public health crisis on their hands when they were looking at some um, water testing that was coming from a, a, one of their utilities. And they go out there and they, they looked into it and they couldn't find any problems. And yet the, test, the, 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 the samples were all coming back badly. And then one day they said, okay, we're going to go around with the guy taking the samples to find out. Turns out he was smoking. 
as he's taking the water samples. And so particles from his cigarette were getting into the water sample, and that was causing oh bad God. things to happen. So very it's very easy to screw these things up, right? I mean, so I, I think that's the thing that would give me some pause, mm -hmm. right? Is, is would we accidentally make mm -hmm. things worse because we get a lot of false positives? There was a question here. Oh. Okay. Uh, one thing you talk a lot about priors, and something that I think a lot about with priors is that a substantial amount of the Earth's population does not have clean drinking water, does not have clean tap water. A uh, substantial amount of the U.S. population, obviously, is immigrant communities, especially Hispanic individuals in mm -hmm. Texas and Southwest. To what extent? Does that prior, the prior of coming from a place without clean water, mm -hmm. kind of influence perspectives? And what is that doing given that these individuals genuinely, generally tend to have higher trust in government as a whole outside of this one area? So I'm, I'm with you 90% of the way. Uh, first of all, the, 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 uh, the priors for folks who come into the United States from parts of the world with poor drinking water are exactly what you'd expect. And we, you know, it's not just our finding, a raft of research in public health shows that. Um, people who come from, from South Asia, come from South America, Central America, yeah, Sub-Saharan Africa, they have similar attitudes, right? So exactly what you'd expect. And exactly as you'd expect over time as, you know, as generations turn over trust in the tap water slowly increases. Um, uh, we think that, that that imported distrust is just a phenomenon of the same, uh, it's just a reflection of the same phenomenon we're, we're talking about here. They're, these are our failures of government provision and government regulation in some sense the, the, the host, the, the former country. That, and so the attitudes, the learned distrust from elsewhere gets imported. So it's the same distrust, but I, I figure, well, I came from a place where governments are, are lousy, corrupt, and inefficient, um, and so I figure governments are always lazy, corrupt, and inefficient. Uh, and I'm not sure that trust in government in immigrant populations is, is really any higher than trust in tap water. That's the place where I was gonna part company with you. Um, I, think, I think that it's, it's, uh, it's just kind of a distrust in institutions generally. I, I, have a, I have a former student who's uh, Mexican American, and his, his parents are, are uh, and gran grandparents are, are Mexican. Um, and he's always, when they go to restaurants, he's, he, he says it's happened over and over again. He has to tell them it's okay to drink the water that they, they put out there in front of you. Uh, and even though it's over and over and over and over again because it's, it's so ingrained. But he's gotten over it, right? So it, it can happen. Um, I think it's, it's, just, it's, it's the same rationale. It's the, it's the same logic at work. It's just mm -hmm. been imported. It's interesting because like, when my parents came to this country from other places where you know, they didn't have a lot of trust in government. And um, it was always when we were growing up, this is America. Like, the government is fantastic here. They do everything for us here compared to where I came from. So it was kind of the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My parents, too. Yeah. Just one of my parents. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting to think about, yeah. Uh, I think Topher and then Ryan. Um, what incentive do governments have to actually change the way that they communicate information to uh, people that live within those cities when consumers are still required to pay water bills for things like flushing their toilet sure. and showering and washing their clothes? Um, it seems like the water that we get through our faucet that we put a cup under is still the same water that is doing all of the other things that our households need to do. Um, and so I'm wondering what governments, what incentive they have when they know at the end of the day they're still going to get payment for that water bill. Yeah, another great question. You guys are bringing it. Uh, <laughs> nice. Um, it's a great question. We, take, we actually take this up in the book. Uh, for those of you who don't, don't know this stuff, the, the water that we drink, like we literally drink it out of a cup or whatever, is it's a tiny fraction of the water that utilities sell. It's mostly going for the other things you talk about. Flushing the toilet, running your dishwasher, washing machine, so on. Uh, most of our water use in the home is for things other than drinking or even drinking and cooking. Uh, it's mostly other things. So when bottled water first came onto the scene, I've been working in the water sector for about 25, 27 years. When bottled water first came on the scene, the water sector didn't care 
because it's just a, we're a natural monopoly. We're taught the amount of water that the bottled water company is taking away from us is a rounding error, right? It's, it's not a significant mm. sum of money. If people want to waste their money on this thing because they like buying pet rocks, fine, go ahead. <laughs> buy buy a, a bottle of water, fine, go ahead. Um, what we show in the book, though, is the reason why utilities should care is that bottled water drinkers are significantly less supportive of public investments in infrastructure, which is not an obvious finding. So tap water drinkers support greater investment. Bottled water drinkers do not. And you know, I, when I mention this, a lot of folks go, yeah, well, that makes sense. No, you can actually imagine the logic going the other way. You could imagine that if, if I am satisfied with my tap water and I drink it all the time straight out of the tap, and you come to me and say, we want to invest another $10 million in, our, in my water plant, I'm going, why? Why, that this is fine, I'm happy with the product. Why are you gonna raise my rates 15%? I'm, I'm fine with the product now. Uh, and you could imagine someone who's unhappy with tap water and buying $2 a gallon bottles of Aquafina. If you offered me, you're saying, wait, if, I, if my, my, my monthly bill only goes up by 10 bucks and I'm gonna mm -hmm. not have to spend $200 on, on uh, bottled water, that's great, sign me up. And, but we find the opposite, right? We find that people who distrust tap water don't want to pay for better tap water. People who trust tap water are perfectly willing to pay more. The only explanation for that has to, it can be trust. It has to be that I believe that the utility or the regulator, uh, they're going to be good stewards of my resource as a rate payer. Uh, and so that's why they should care. So we don't end on that note. Can you give us an upside? <laughs> uh, water, government, something. Yeah. <laughs> These problems are soluble. I think, I think that, is, that is the hopeful thing. I am that, that strangest of all creatures. I am an optimist who studies environmental policy. Uh, I'm an optimist who studies American government. Uh, and I, I've been on a lot of panels with a lot of, a lot of um, pessimistic people. Mm -hmm. uh, these problems are soluble. They, that, that's what, I'll, I'll leave with a theme that, we, that was in that closing passage. What's, what's so important about water is that, these pro, that this is an easy problem to solve from a technical and economic perspective. We can do these things. Mm -hmm. This is not like climate change that it's just so intractable. It's very tractability is what makes water a winner. And I, I really think we can restore, uh, we can restore trust uh, in, and we can restore trust in the state. And it's, it's gonna require leadership. That, that's really the answer. Um, you know, it, 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 leadership's a renewable resource. You know, we, we, we're, we're not. We're, we're at a low point. Yeah. But but you know, we we've been at worst.